for the ride. <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome everybody to No-Till Gardening. It's very exciting as we're all getting amped up for the season. Uh, my name is Kelly. I'm with Lakeland Agricultural Research Association. I'm very happy to have uh, Lucy Campbell with us tonight. Uh, she, I've actually seen her no-till garden. Uh, we went and toured your ranch a couple of years ago, I think when you're just getting into it. So it was kind of interesting. So it's I'll be interested to see where it's progressed to. Um, so yeah, so I will just turn it over to you. Um, if everybody has questions, please feel free to use the Q&A and the chat. Um, and we'll kind of get those more to the end of the presentation. But yeah, feel free to start putting out questions as we get to move along. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, for asking me to speak. I really love speaking about gardening. It's the easiest crowd. And um, I, so I'm, I'm really curious to know why you're all here. Uh, everyone has, a, you know, a different reason. And so I had asked Kelly to pull together a poll. And I'd like if you're interested to um, engage in the poll just to see. So just click on one of the possible options. I know there are other options, but um, just wanted to kind of see why you're here. So go ahead and do that. And and we'll, uh, hopefully I'll be able to address some of those things. While you're doing that, I would uh, just like to introduce myself. I'm Bluzette Campbell. I live uh, north and west of Meadow Lake on the B Bar C Ranch. We raise cattle here and uh, we practice holistic management. So you're going to hear me use the term holistic management. I'm not here to sell you on those points, but you can hear me talk about it quite a bit. Uh, because it is uh, a way that we can improve the land using our cattle. We'd really like to leave the land better than we found it. And it was the inspiration for uh, making changes in my garden. So uh, I was in my garden and I realized that what I was doing in my garden was completely opposite of how we were managing our 4,000 acres here near the Beaver River. So that's where my no-till gardening uh, expedition began. So do, how long do you want to leave that poll? Oh, there they are, less work. Yeah, well, I can just tell you right now, they're um, doing, doing less work in this world is what everybody wants, but is not always possible. <laughs> uh, no, but there's definitely some things that I will address. Um, if you have back pain, well, maybe we can help out with that. Healthier food, I hate weeding. Funny that I thought I hate weeding would have been up at the top. Um, a few that don't have any idea and quite a few that love soil. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kelly. All right. Well, um, I want to get right into it. Um, uh, I have a, a presentation for you. I'm hoping that, uh, I address some of your questions or concerns during the presentation. Uh, don't mind that you could ask questions in the chat and I'll kind of have, um, Kelly, keep an eye out for those. And instead of me just droning on and on, I uploaded some videos just so that you can see, uh, especially over the last couple of years, I was hoping to upload some from today. Oh, goodness. Sorry about that. Upload some from today. Um, but I didn't get a chance to do that. But these are very similar uh, videos that I'd like to show you. So I think we'll just get started. Okay, Open that just a second to to load. So I'm talking to you today about um, my ability to build soil, which I never really thought was possible. Um, I thought that it would take decades, even uh, you know, centuries to build soil. I mean, we certainly know that we have an impact on um, being able to degrade soil very quickly. And so the principle would hold true. If we can degrade it, maybe we can build it. And so this has been sort of my journey in my garden is being able to change the soil that I currently have. And I do that in an unconventional way. So I coin myself as the unconventional gardener, although I must say, it's becoming much more conventional for people to adopt, not exactly what I do, but some of the things that I'm doing and lots of things that other gardeners are also doing. 
but ultimately I want to build soil because I feel like if I have better soil, I have better food, I have healthier, healthier bodies and my family. Um, I also really enjoy taking some photographs of what it is that I grow. Uh, probably not quite as much as I enjoy eating things that I grow, but almost as much. And um, the colors just really inspire me. And I can actually smell that parsley and rosemary right now and salivating just a little bit as I, as I wait for the arrival of spring and to get down there in my garden. What does unconventional gardening mean to me? Um, this is about, and some of the questions I'd like you to ask yourself is what are the reasons why you are gardening? I think everyone has a preconceived notion of what gardening is, and maybe that's, um, that's fulfilling for you, and maybe it's not. Maybe that's one of the reasons why you're here. Uh, I might be challenging some of the paradigms that you have around that preconceived notion or around what you might think gardening is. Doesn't mean you have to adopt what I think. I'm certainly not here to tell you what to do, but I'd like to ask you uh, quite a few questions that may challenge those paradigms. I believe that uh, as, as in most of my work as a consultant and as a rancher is about figuring out the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so that is my context, that's my goal. And as you heard me say, I wanna see if I have the impact on the soil to make it better. So I have healthier food, so I have healthier you know, family members. And I want to make sure that what I'm doing in my garden uh, follows the principles of, you know, soil health. Um, and what I was doing before wasn't necessarily following those rules. So determining context is a really big uh, part of my presentations. I'm always asking people, well, why? Why are you doing it that way? Um, aiming for that healthy soil, I think, is um, not that that's unconventional, but I think our practices, our actions uh, spoke louder than our words. We may all want to have healthy soil, but some of our behaviors or the systems that we had in place weren't necessarily manifesting that. Um, and back to that point, if I, if, if I can learn about that and have healthier soil, I'll have healthier food, healthier people. And this is where I think I'd really like to spend some time tonight is about, it's not just about the food that we eat, it's about what our actions do to that soil. And I am hopefully going to impart some concepts around the ecosystem of your garden and how you, you can determine or tell relatively quickly how things are going and if you're improving uh, the soil or the ecosystem always asking the question like is, are things going the way that I'd like them to and if not why is that and do I have the ability am I adaptive and can I change those things so if you've always tilled and you think that's the way um, that uh, gardening must be I'll challenge your paradigms I'll ask you why you're gardening and see if aiming for healthy soil is one of those things I might impart a little bit of wisdom around the um ecosystem processes like water cycle, for example, and then ask you, you know, how do you know if you're, if you're achieving your goals? So that's why it's a little unconventional. Most people put the seeds in the garden, maybe water, maybe weed and eat something in the fall. This is a little bit different than that. Um, I have uh, also decided that what I plant and what I eat, it has changed over the many years. So I think now if I'm doing the math correctly. I think it's now 14 years. Maybe this is going into my 15th year of zero till. And so I would say, well, that's not exactly proven. It's proof enough for me that I can continue on with doing these practices. And that uh, during these practices, I've expanded, um, you know, I've tried all kinds of things like eating nettle, not as not because I really want to do that, but because I know it's possible. Um, chickweed, a few other things that I've tried just because I'm a very curious human being. Uh, this is just lettuce. Uh, black seeded Simpson, I think, in there. So, so let's talk a little bit about the paradigm. What does that mean? I don't want to be cryptic, but I do want to say that this is just merely a belief system, and we all have them. It's okay, paradigm is not a bad word. Um, but changing paradigms can be sometimes painful. And so I thought maybe I'd just give you a quick example. 
Um, my father-in-law, who I consider a very wise man, once told me if I want to make small changes, just go out and change the way I did do something. So I could just stop telling. That was something. But if I want to make big changes, I needed to change the way that I saw things. And that's what this no-till gardening, among many other things in my life, has actually brought to the surface, is that I'm actually looking at that garden from a totally different perspective. So I thought I would just give you a very simplified version of a paradigm shift by showing you this image. And so you can probably determine that it's rocks in the water, you might be a little confused by the clouds that seem to be on the bottom, but you would quickly recognize that's reflection in the water and that you have a, you know, a nice image. I'd like to challenge you is to see you see something different now. So you might not, but I kind of prompted you. So if you turn your head around, you'll see the same image. It might appear that the rocks are floating. So all this demonstrates, again, a simplified version, is that a slightly different perspective will give you a different view. And so once, if you are able to see the rocks, it's just a different way of looking at it. If you're not able to see the floating rocks, we should probably have a conversation about your paradigms because there you might be stuck in one right now. But the reason why I show you this image is because immediately when I prompt you with another image, most people will see a floating rock right away. And that's because we've prepared you to see that. And so if I hadn't shown you that first image, it might be very hard for you to make sense of this. And that means that it's a harder paradigm to shift. Now, this is just an optical illusion, but I'm sort of getting at what I might be challenging you to think about tonight is whether no-till gardening works. Again, I've been doing it for 15 years, so I know that it does. And I'm not here to say you must change, that you're here because you want to be for some reason. And so maybe just kind of taking your the glasses that you currently have on and shifting those to something else, even for just tonight, that would be very, very helpful in some of these concepts. So here's that image right side up, right side down. All right, it's just some more colors here. Love those colors. Anybody else excited for making salsa this year? It's not that far away. So aiming for healthy soils, what exactly does that mean? Um, you know, I mean, I find all kinds of joy in gardening. I love being outside, not necessarily when there's so many mosquitoes, but choosing the time that I spend outside in the garden for working in it or harvesting, I do find it quite enjoyable, but I don't want to be married to it. And I certainly don't want to be down there 24 um, seven. One of the things that, that draws my attention to the garden is trying to figure out how do I improve it? So I know on our ranch that we use the cattle as a tool to improve the land. And uh, I might bring a few cows in, but I'm less likely to bring some cows in. Uh, it's a little more challenging into my two thirds of an acre garden. I do have some chickens from time to time and I know that they would help, but I ask myself, what can I do to help improve the soil? I might know that animals would help even faster, but what can I do personally? So these are some of the things that I really want to talk about tonight. We wouldn't necessarily think about these in this context. You might in agriculture if you're growing crops, but you know if we're um, if we're honest with ourselves, that's basically what we're doing in our garden, right? We're growing a crop or crops of some kind. So I'd like to sort of introduce some language that uh, is common everyday language in my garden. Exudates. Those are basically things that come out of the root system that feed the microbiology. It's the carbohydrates or the sugars that come out of the root systems. And so I'm trying to help that process along because the more exudates I have, the more microbiology I'm feeding and the better the plants do overall and the more they help improve my soil. So I'm trying to increase the amount of exudates. I'm also looking at fungal to bacterial ratio. And I'm not getting super scientific, so I don't go out there and I measure this and measure that. I know that people do. Um, it's really not my cup of tea. All I know is that I want to balance. And a, good, a colleague of mine, Blaine Jurdis, had said in his work that um, there used to be a balance of one-to-one. -one. For every fungi, there was a bacteria. 
And now through our current agricultural practices, it's more one fungi to a hundred bacteria. So we are out of balance overall. Now, I don't know what the balance is in my garden. All I want uh, to, to create is a one-to-one -one if I can. So I'm trying to foster that relationship or that ratio. I also think about um, what goes in and what goes out, much like a bank account. So I'm thinking about the overall, my conventional practices were I pulled everything off of the garden, you know, the things that we ate, plus whatever was left over, and either tried to compost it, burn it, or feed it to some animal. And I was constantly taking a very high volume of plant material off, leaving the land sort of barren or the soil barren with no cover at all and nothing to decompose. And then I'd go back in spring and try to put some compost and you know, haul in manure from the manure pile from the you know, 20 years ago where the cattle used to be and it was quite a process. And so there was an in and out, but it wasn't very sustainable. And so I changed that relationship quite a bit about, I only take out what we eat, everything else stays there. And the only other input that I'm putting in has to have some other purpose, like mulch, like covering the bare ground. And I'll get to that in a little bit. And then lastly, this practice of monitoring for results. I can change my behaviors and hope for the best. But if I don't reflect on whether it's getting me closer to my goal or not, I won't know what direction I'm headed. So if I wanna cover all the bare ground, at some point in time, I might wanna go down to my garden and say, is all the bare ground covered? And if not, what am I gonna do to change that? That's what I'm talking about, this feedback loop of just asking myself some really simple questions and taking a little bit of time to reflect on that. So those I believe are unconventional gardening practices. Am I creating more exudates? What is my fungal bacterial ratio? Uh, am I taking account or reconciling my, my soil bank account? And am I monitoring or, or engaging in a feedback loop to see if I'm on the right track? So just a few pictures here. Um, the picture to the left is the soil base that I am working from. That's right off of the road that we drive in. That's an exposed soil. And uh, basically we live on beach sand. And you know, there's some great qualities about sand, but there's also some extreme challenges with it too. The picture on the right was about seven years in to no-till. So, and my garden is right next to the road. So it's exactly the same soil, but after eight years of zero till, um, you can see quite a few changes in the structure and architecture of that soil. Okay, so this is where I'm not going to spend a ton of time because I don't want to bore you, but this is really valuable information to be able to go down to your garden and assess how healthy are these ecosystem processes. If that sounds confusing to you, I'm going to explain it in um, fairly simple terms. Energy flow is an ecosystem process, and it talks about bringing this solar energy, which is virtually free for us, <laughs> um, bringing the solar energy into your garden and transferring it into the soil. And that ability to do that well is effective energy flow. If you think about bare ground, the sun comes down and heats up the soil surface and often bounces right back off. What we're trying to um, do is to have as many solar panels or leaves or plants or growth available to capture that solar energy through photosynthesis and draw things back down into the soil. So a healthy energy flow is how much plant cover you have, that covering the bare ground. It doesn't even have to be growing, but I think photosynthesis is the fastest way we know how to convert that energy into the soil. Water cycle, which is directly affected or connected to energy flow, is how, um, how effective a water cycle is, is what happens to a, a rain droplet when it hits on your garden. If you have exposed soil, it's likely going to um, evaporate or run off. It might go in, but it won't go in as effectively if there's something there to sort of cushion the fall. 
like some straw, a blade of grass, a tomato plant, where it hits it and then sort of trickles down and then is absorbed into the sponge of soil. So if there's nothing growing on the surface, your water cycle is less effective because it doesn't stay there to be available for those plants. It'll evaporate or it'll run off and perhaps erode a little bit as it goes. If you have healthy energy flow, which means a lot of solar panels or you know leaves, you probably have a more effective water cycle. So they're very interconnected. Also connected is the mineral cycle how quickly things turn around. If you've got a lot of activity and you have moisture and uh, conducive temperature, things will decompose very quickly. In my first year of no-till gardening, I thought, won't I be brilliant to plant my peas where my corn stalks are this year? Because they're really hard to remove. So I'll just leave them there and I'll grow peas. Well, what happens is when you start to have some healthy um, microbiology, they break down way too quickly, <laughs> way too quickly. So when there's you know, moisture and cover, um, it creates a great environment for things to de decompose very quickly. So also connected to the water cycle. And lastly, community dynamics, which is this diversity of species and things growing at all different stages at all different times of the year as much as possible. So I'm gonna show you quite a few pictures but the concept I really want to hone in on is nature wants to protect the soil surface. If we think about, now this is a paradigm shift because when we think about gardening and tilling our garden, we're creating the space to garden. We're creating soil so that we can put the plant or the seed in and the seed will have soil contact and we'll water it and we'll care for it and weed and all those things and it'll grow. Nature wants to cover all that bare ground. So it will grow something. Chickweed, portulaca, lamb's quarter, you know, uh, pigweed, kochia, whatever it is, uh, something will wanna grow. And it's doing that for a reason. Because if it puts out a dandelion or a thistle or a nettle, it's covering the bare ground. It's creating canopy to some degree to protect the soil from the intense heat, or from you know erosion from a rain hard rain, uh, and then it will hold moisture and the soil together. It'll hold moisture and prevent the erosion um, from happening. And then there's more available water for the plants that you do want to grow. So what we've been doing for a long time is saying, well, no, I don't want the dandelion or the thistle or the stinging nettle to grow. I only want my lettuce or my carrots or my green beans to grow. So we do and we go to great lengths to remove all of those successional plants. We say, no nature, we don't want that to grow, we want this to grow. And the soil doesn't care, right? The soil wants something covering it. So if you put something on the soil to cover it, you can prevent those other successional plants from taking over and creating more competition. So I'm gonna talk a lot about how we cover that bare ground without have over competing with the plants that we wanna grow. So those are the four areas and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about um, those four ecosystem processes. I, I wanna get to a little more detail like what that looks like in a picture. So you can see on the left here, there is very little. If you dropped a pencil down, the tip of that pencil is not likely to touch soil. It's going to touch something else like kale, like dill, like corn, or some type of mulch on the soil surface. And maybe some grass. I see a little bit of brome or quack or something growing there. But when you think about light coming from the sun, what happens to it? It hits that leaf and is automatically photosynthesizing, and that energy is being drawn down into the soil. It's not being lost through, trans, uh, through evaporation or erosion. So this ability to capture solar energy is a bit of a paradigm shift in going down. Because if you looked at my garden now, you, would you wouldn't see very much bare soil at all. And you would see a lot of things green and even growing right now. So they are already at work in feeding the microorganisms, which I'm super excited about. 
water cycle. So this is actually a soil plug out of our pasture, but you'll see later that it's very similar to what's in my garden. So what happens when a water droplet hits this pasture is it, it'll hit one of those stems, whether it's green or brown, doesn't matter, and it's gonna roll down and come in contact with the soil or kind of that layer of thatch there and be soaked up like a sponge and be available for any of those plants. So thinking about effective water cycle and how that translates into the garden. Do we have an effective water cycle there? These are, this is the shun slide. So there's a lot of shuns here. There's all kinds of things that are going on. We don't have to understand everything about it other than to say, if the rain falls, I wanna capture it for as long as possible so that it is beneficial to the plants that are growing there, no matter what that is. Mineral cycle. So this is Dr. Elaine Ingham's um, graphic here. Uh, I don't need to know all the names of the things that are living in my soil. I just need to know that they're doing their job. So I need to feed them. That's how it works here on the ranch. If you feed somebody, they'll work for you. <laughs> and so I'm in the business of feeding these guys. And through that process, then the plants will, you know, feed them. And then we have a very healthy ecosystem of um, you know, a food chain, if you will, of things happening. I don't have to understand that. I just have to know that it's much more complex than I can probably totally understand. And so I'm gonna make decisions in my garden that will facilitate good mineral cycling. So available moisture, not too hot, not too cold, um, you know, covering, protecting things from direct sunlight or intense precipitation events. So healthy nutrients. And this is a really good sign that things are, are working. I'm feeding those the microbiology. This is what exudates look like. It's this like glue around the roots that happens to be quack grass, by the way, which is my new best friend. Um, those hairline roots are covered in sugar or carbohydrate, which then glues the soil to them. That's how I know there's enough um, fodder for the microbiology. So I used to try to get rid of every blade of grass. And now I want every blade of grass to grow as long as it's not in competition with what I'm growing. And so you can see in the background that's a little bit blurry there, there's grass everywhere because grass is working for me. Grass is feeding the microbiology that is improving my soil so that the plants that I want to grow and eat are the most nutrient dense that I can that I can grow. And lastly, the community dynamics. So when you look at my uh, garden in the fall, it is a jungle. There is all kinds of different heights of plants, variety of plants. It's not completely laissez-faire. There is some order to it. There's, um, you know, companion gardening happening. I don't have, you know, my tomatoes and potatoes and you know, all growing in the same place. I, you know, I intentionally map things out, but everything is covered. Like even where I walk, you can see there's things growing, there's pansies and borage and, you know, all kinds of stuff, but there's also wherever there isn't something growing, there's mulch. So there's something covering the bare ground. You can see sunflowers and corn and there's cucumbers over there. There's all kinds of things. So there's a lot of diversity. And they're at all different heights and uh, you know, doing all kinds of things. And if I didn't cover the bare ground, well, nature's gonna put something there for me. So oh, here's what it looked like sort of in the beginning stages. You can see all the grass. Like I live in the boreal forest here and it's in its natural state. There would be poplars and well, carraganas, which aren't really natural, but uh, Saskatoon berries, all kinds of shrubs, buckbrush and meadow rue and all kinds of stuff. So I'm actually, you know, I know things grow here, but I'm kind of in competition with the boreal forest so that it doesn't go back to boreal forest because I do want it to uh, remain a garden plot. I think it's actually been here for over 90 years. So I like to kind of keep that if I can. But you can see a lot of bare ground. Um, you know, I didn't take my corn stalks that first year. This is what it looked like in the spring. And uh, I know that that soil temperature is going to heat up quickly with contact with the sun uh, and probably dry out really quickly because I have super sandy soil. 
So this is what my feedback loop looked like was, I know I need to cover that bare ground to create a better habitat for the microbiology. So I spent the next several years figuring out how to do that. And this is more what it looks like today. I mean, right, you might think I'm totally crazy. It's like, how do you grow anything in there? That's actually, you know, it does look more like a, a cow pasture. That's very intentional. This is what it does. And I mean, I don't know, my paradigm shift has come so far in the last, you know, close to 15 years, but this just makes my heart sing. If you look at the, I mean, there's all kinds of things going on. There's, oh, there's some chickweed and some grass, which I don't find problematic because look at my beans and the dill, super healthy. Look at those really great healthy cucumbers in the background. There's celery and poppies and fennel and there's just, there's all kinds of stuff happening. And this is the natural state, if you will. I mean, they were planted. It's very intentional, but it's the natural state of the garden. Um, you know, it's not like I don't go down there and I just let things go wherever they want. Um, there's, there's some intention behind it, but there's so much going on here above and below ground. To sort of what, what it looks like in the fall as things are starting to freeze off, dry off a little bit or dry out a little bit. Um, lots of things happening here too. This is uh, closer to my perennial bed where I have you know onions and herbs going and I'm letting things go to seed. You can see there's beets going, growing there. The peas are already dried off in the background and lots of mulch and on the bottom. Lots of diversity, can't stress that enough. So this is what I mean by monitoring for results. Um, you know, you have a plan, you probably buy your seed or you, you know, you look at your inventory and see what you have and you make a bit of a plan or you might make that plan when you go down there the first time and say, yep, I think I'm gonna put carrots and potatoes here and something over here, but it's a plan. The monitoring piece is going down and saying, okay, well, how are things coming up? Oh, geez, the, you know, carrots didn't germinate. I wonder why. You might think about that and then you might replant or you might say, I'm throwing that you know, out the window this year, I'm gonna buy carrots from the neighbor or whatever, or the store. Um, and then you could also then reflect and say, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. If I slightly change it or control, that's where that control piece is. I'm gonna control what I can and then I'm gonna make a, a replant. Next year, I don't think the carrots you know, really want this area of the garden, it's too shady, too cool or you know, something's not quite right. So I'm gonna change it up and I'm gonna monitor next year and see if it did any better. Constant feedback loop. Say that plan is a 24 letter word. It's actually, if you add all those letters together, it's a, it's a longer word than that. <laughs> you don't just plan, you monitor control and then replan, that's how we learn. This is what basically what it looks like right now down in my garden, not quite so green, we don't, had a very slow spring, but this is probably, you know, first of May, uh, this would be 2020, 2020 maybe, <laughs> not gonna say for sure, but not that long ago. And uh, so lots of grass growing, um, but you can believe it, my, my peas are planted there, uh, probably have my potatoes in and that's probably about it. Maybe some, you know, lettuces, spinach, those kinds of things, but this garden is planted. I remember the bus driver when my kids were young driving by and saying, gee, are you not gonna do any gardening this year? So yeah, actually it's all planted. She was floored. It just looks like it's relatively neglected. So this is kind of what changed the way I thought about the bare ground. I was covering with all kinds of um, mulch to prevent you know, the weeds from taking over, sort of weeds from taking over. and and then I, uh, you know, I did some work with uh, uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham's web webinar and really discovering, okay, so what's going on down below the surface? And, uh, you know, I don't want to fight the quack grass anymore. And so she made a few statements that really shifted the way I thought about the, all the grass growing and that some of the best soils are built under perennial stands of grasses. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. This is a, a plant that can, can take, you know, a lot of mowing quack grass and, and brome. They can, they can be mowed all the time and you can't get rid of them. That's why we have lawns, right? We can mow them three times a week if we need to. 
but that below that surface, there's all kinds of exudates going into the soil and feeding the microbiology. And so not only does it protect the soil, it feeds the microbiology, it prevents the you know, temperature from getting too hot and all those, and I know I sound repetitive, but I can't say it enough. Covering that bare ground is the most exciting principle I think I can impart on you. And when we do that, then all these kinds of things happen. You move from one soil type to another just based on your management. So this picture here is what it looks like when I start. So um, I've droned on, on and on, but I wanna show you uh, a bit of the soil profile. So this is, I think all of my videos are quite short, so um, maybe a minute or so. I just wanted to take a uh, poll where the potatoes were last year. I used my trusty spade, I dug a hole. Um, it's probably about 18 inches deep. It took me four shovel poles. And I got to eventually what you would see as my soil type, which is pure sand. But this is the soil that I'm building, which is aggregated, still quite a bit sandy, but darker in color, lots of roots. And so I wanted to show the profile and it may be hard to see, but here's down below, you can see the aggregation, lots of material, but this is what we're looking at. And this is what I'm trying to develop. Instead of having a completely black tilled garden surface, you can see through the sides there's basically lawn but it's just solar panels i'm growing the solar panels to capture the solar energy that arrives almost every day during our growing growing season and it takes that energy and transfers it into the soil through this root system and this this is thatch here which is about two inches and i've developed that over the last 11 years by mowing and allowing it to grow in the places where I don't plant my my vegetables. So I just wanted you to see the whole, <clears throat> the soil that is available for me to grow. You can see this root structure, the architecture here. There's some hairline roots that are really helping me out. And that's where I grew my potatoes last year. And I'll just put this back in and mix it all up. There's lots of earthworms in there. I feel like a cat <laughs> filling back this, this hole, but you can see that all along this potato row, there's soil, usable soil for my vegetables. Right next to it is ground that's maturing and getting ready in three years or five years, whenever I decide to put my row there. And you can just see all across my garden, that's why there's grass. On this two thirds of an acre, it's all developing soil. Thanks, buddy. So, there, I mean, it, it looks very different. And, you know, I know that people, um, and I want to honor the people who have been trying to get rid of their grass forever. Uh, but once I understood how helpful it actually is, I needed to figure out a system of how I could work in conjunction with the grass uh, so that it wouldn't outcompete what I wanted to grow. So I've got a few videos to show you. But I do have some more soil profile, like these sideways shots, because there's a lot going on here. There's more activity than I could ever describe. But if you see there's green root growing, so there's photosynthesis, there's old plant material, which is decomposing. There's all kinds of root structure here. When I mow the top, I know a certain amount of those roots die back because that's where the energy is stored to create more leaves on that grass plant to capture the solar energy. So I mow it, I feed the microorganisms, it grows again, I mow it, it feeds the micro, you get the picture. And then I've got all this old mulch, you know, like the grass clippings go right back onto the surface. I have straw and things that I've used to uh, outcompete 
the the forbs or the you know the weeds that are growing and so that's sort of in there you see there's architecture there there is capacity there to hold air which those microorganisms need there's tunnels for moisture which those microorganisms need and there's uh, things that are decaying that build compost and build my soil. And then there's roots there that feed those microorganisms. So there's a very comp and there's so much more going on, I'm sure. Um, but when I think about uh, the fungal bacterial racial, I can go in there and smell, you know what that soil smells like. It smells pretty darn good. And I believe that that smell is an indication that I'm getting back to that one-to-one -one ratio. It may not be perfect, but I think I'm headed in the right direction. So here's a really great example of the aggregation. So I have a lot of sand and sand doesn't aggregate very well. It needs other things. It needs decomposition and that aggregation or that cottage cheese-like effect will hold these little clumps of soil together and create those airways and waterways and um, the, you know, basically highways for microorganisms to, to travel. Again, more picture, I love the soil. I mean, I like pictures of food too, but this, this is where the bomb, the magic happens here. So when you look at the soil surface, you think, well, you know, how do I plant like amaranth? If you want to plant amaranth, they're tiny, tiny seeds or poppies or lettuce or how does that happen? Because there's so much cover there. Well, when I mulch, I notice that things don't need to drill down with their root systems. They've got everything they need, all the nutrients in the top. So I actually have some videos to show how I create a bed. And I use that same bed for three or five years, depending on what I think I want to do. And, uh, and then I'll move it around, but it doesn't take me very long to create a new row because I've created this uh, basically carpet or like sod that you buy, turf that you would buy to uh, put in a lawn. Here's another video, Here's my turf machine right here. Okay, it's May 7th, snow is finally gone. Here's my... Um, no-till gardening best friend, my mulcher, <laughs> it's the old lawnmower. And I showed yesterday the where the peas were last year and where the potatoes are going in. And this is what it looks like. So for those of you that, that know me, covering the bare ground, creating the soil armor is uh, what I'm aiming to do. So you can see very little bare ground, if at all, like I guess you could call that it's a little bit of bare ground um but i'm going to mulch it because i'm going to plant the potatoes hopefully today or maybe tomorrow and i'm just uh bringing this down to the surface uh with the mulcher as close as i can it's a little bit wet we got a drizzle of rain last night uh, but i'm i'm going to try to create just a little bit of soil surface for the potato seed potatoes so i'll take another video later So, oh, I think this is actually, but this is where it's described how, or like what my plan is or how I, I, I plant those potatoes for anybody who's interested. So I mulched the old pea area for the potato area this year. And again, the uh, armor or soil cover is here. This is actually where a row is. And there's another row and I'm just pulling away the mulch with a, a rake and you can see this is where the peas were last year and so what I'll do is I'll go along and just drop the potato seed right in the dirt this is pretty um you know it's, it's not tilled but it looks tilled um just from all the aeration and so I'll just plop the potato seed right there and I have the material that I've just raked up right here and I'll just put that right back over the top and as they sprout I will continue to mulch up just like you would sort of hilling just to protect the potatoes and help build the plant. So I'll have more progress later. 
So this is me doing my social media posts. So, you know, you can follow me on Facebook. I post a lot of my videos and the progress. So I'm actually talking to a, a wider audience that kind of follows what I'm doing. Oh, sorry, here we go. So you see the progression of the potatoes. It's the final pro products of planting the potatoes 2022. I've only planted half of them, but this is what it looks like. You know, it's not that much different than what the soil armor looked like before the potatoes were planted, and that's sort of the idea. Here are the rows that they looked like before. Those will be planted probably in a week, and that's what it looks like after. So, and I, I still have a few more videos um, about how I create those beds, but, um, you know, I, I think for some of you, you're like, yeah, that makes total sense. Like I'm, I'm doing something similar or for some of you, you're like, oh my gosh, he's totally out to lunch and that's okay. That's okay. Cause there's space in this world for all of us. So it really is about deciding what is it that you want? So I know that I'm succeeding because I'm getting what I want, but you might not want the same thing. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just offering that there are many ways of doing things. So these are pictures out of, you know, out of my garden that says, I always have a big bale. I prefer really old, like five-year-old straw if I can get it. I know that a lot of straw around here is not organic. So it's probably had some glyphosate on it. So the older it is, the better for me. Uh, my preference for mulch is hay because farmers uh, tend to spray their hay so much less than uh, if at all um, than their, you know, their cereal crops. But sometimes this is all I have. So I'll use straw, I'll use hay, I'll use grass clippings, I'll use whatever I have. But I monitor to make sure that I have enough aeration, you know, and there's not too much moisture. You can tell when things are not in balance. And so I'll adjust accordingly. So this middle picture is when the potatoes start to come out. And so I've pulled the straw away a little bit, just so you can see that they're growing underneath that straw. They're clearly getting enough uh, sunlight because they're not, um, they're dark green, they're photosynthesizing. Uh, and then, you know, later in the season, they've come up that these plants are probably, now oh, the photos distorted a little bit, but I'm gonna say 18, yeah, 18 inches to about two feet tall. Paul, and I've just taken the, the mulch and pushed it up to the sides so that it's holding, supporting the plant and then covering any potatoes that, you know, might be growing because I don't want them to get sunburned. And then I just mow with my mower in between those rows and it mulches that straw and pushes it up against the plant. And, you know, I can have my entire potato patch. So it's between three and 400 hills weeded with my lawnmower in about 20 or 30 minutes. It's so that less work aspect of the pole, this is where that comes in really handy. Uh, less weeding, uh, creating better soil, check check that off. Um, for those of you who don't know why you're here, hopefully you're just here to see some pretty pictures and that I'm also appealing to your senses. Here's what a, a, a picture might look like uh, in the you know mid, mid spring, early summer, you can see the corn there is probably, a, again, it's a little distorted, but is probably, uh, you know, at least a foot, if not 18 inches high. You can see some bean plants growing in the background. Peas are coming up. There's some um, squash or pumpkins probably in the front there. This is a few years ago, but I immediately see bare ground. Most people would say, oh my God, look at all those weeds. How can you ever grow things in the grass? Um, but I, what I see is exposed soil. So I immediately say, man, I could do a better job. There's the feedback loop, cover the bare ground, get that covered. Because what I know is if I don't get rain because I have really sandy soil, it's going to be too dry. And I don't want to be in the business of artificially watering my garden if I don't have to. So if I just cover that, it's going to retain the moisture for me. Here's what the pea patch looks like, um, you know, a lot of mulch in between. And, you know, that's how I keep the grass from out competing the peas. I just push that mulch right up to the pea, it sort of trains it to my fence. That's just old sheep fence I found out in the back 40. And, uh, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, sure, there's a little bit of grass here and there, but look at those healthy pea plants. Nothing's getting in their way. Okay, so here's how I 
how I start my rows. If I want to start a new row in Quack and Brome Grass, this is what it looks like. Here's a section. So that was tomatoes last year. It'll likely be tomatoes again this year. And this was just a section that I've been developing. So I let it go to grass and have been mowing it probably two or three years, just mulching it right back down into the soil. So this year I'll probably put some carrots in here. This is right on the edge of the garden next to Saskatoon, Caragamas, Poplar. So it's, you know, carved right out of the forest here. And I'll be making a new bed this year. And many people ask me like, well, what do you do with the sod? And how do you get rid of the quack grass? Well, first of all, I'm not getting rid of the quack. I'm displacing it temporarily. <laughs> and so I just took my spade and cut a line and you can't see it right now, but I cut a line and then I just pull the, pull the grass and because it's been mulched, it grows laterally. So you can see the root system is not very deep and I just shake it off and uh, this today's the 5th of May so um, you know there's a little bit of exudates there. Uh, soil is moist but not not super wet um, but it does allow me to grab a chunk so you can tell where I cut and I just pick it up do a little shaking And the whole plant comes with it, basically. And then there's, this is light. There's basically, I call it the lupus sponge. And all it is is just those hairline roots that have been feeding the soil for the last three years. And I'm gonna put it over here, which acts as mulch in between the rows. So it'll just be like straw, basically. Um, and I do that, so this one will take me about Two or three minutes to do it's probably eight feet long and uh i'll show you the end result so here's the last little bit of the row then shake it out this takes a second for one handful see there's some little Critters in there, earthworms. Pretty excited. And uh, yeah. So this little stretch of about eight feet has uh, you know been minimally disturbed. Yes, it has been. You could argue it's hand tilled or but anyway, it's ready for me to grow the carrots. So all I have to do is sprinkle my carrot seed right over the top. I might use a rake. So that it's covered in contact. And then here is the, the quack root. Can't really tell the difference, but that's where it came from. And that just dries out and turns into straw and helps develop the soil where I'm walking. So um you know, I, I, I know you've heard me say it multiple times. Uh, you know, I'm trying to build the soil here. And um, somebody asked me one time, like, well, how do you know your food is healthier? Um, you know, I'm not in the business of scientifically tracking because I don't really need to prove to anybody. I can taste, you know, I can taste the food. I know it tastes good. I believe it to be nutrient dense. I do have a bricks, um, a refractometer um, where I can squeeze out, you know, the, the juices and see the sugars um, through, through um, refracting the light. and. Uh, you know, we did lots of things when I first started, um, wild blueberries and store-bought blueberries and, you know, homegrown carrots versus store carrots. When my kids were young, it was really fun. Um, I, it's not that it's not important to me. I, I just, I have a lot of other things that I also find more important to do. So I'm not really measuring. And again, I'm not in the business of trying to convince anyone that my food is, you know, is healthier or I'm certainly not in the business of saying my food is healthier than yours, but I'm just trying to create a little bit healthier every year, like a little more nutrient dense, a little more diversity of species. And, uh, you know, and that's how I know I'm, I'm being successful is that I'm measuring myself against what I used to be and what I'm headed towards. This is a demonstration of my tomato plants. Um, 
and so a lot of people say, you know, tomatoes are so delicate. How do they grow in this environment? So um, I just wanted to show you what I do. So I'm just taking apart my tomato buckets. Um, these buckets are designed to house five or six tomatoes at one time and inside the bucket. So this is last year's whatever was growing. Um, the tomato, sorry, the tomato plant goes on the outside, you can see last year's. Inside this bucket is compost from our, you know, kitchen scraps, etc. from last year, uh, the previous year. And so this bucket here is where I set the in between five or six tomato plants. And at the bottom of the bucket is a hole. So any rainfall or any time I have to water, I um, put it into the bucket so it doesn't fall on the, you can see this is really great soil down here, lots of structure, little critters. I just dump that. And this will be, um, you know, nutrients for the next, tomatoes like to be in the same spot, so I'm told. And, you know, this compost is just really rich, really nice color. Uh, I don't worry about little things growing in it, like these roots here are really helping and uh, feeding whatever's going on in there, some eggshells, and then that's ready for this year's planting and another bucket will go on top with fresh compost from over the winter. So I'm happy to talk about that after. We're getting close closer to the end of my presentation. And so we'll take some time for, for questions. But again, um, some uh, you know photos to demonstrate the diversity, what's going on. There's uh, fava beans to the right in the green picture uh, that's on the left-hand side, sorry, but on the, let's see, that's your left on the left of that image. And then there's some um, chickpeas that I'm growing next to them. There's some volunteer dill next to the bean. Oh, you can see my bean bucket is um, getting full there. So clearly I'm spending the next several hours in the kitchen canning those. <laughs> um, but there's just a lot happening, a lot happening there in that image. And, you know, I'm, I'm down in the garden harvesting and I'm just trying to take note of everything that is going on because it's very easy to be worried about, oh, that next volunteer board meeting I got to go to or you know some other ranch decision that I need to make but I really want to be present and notice take notice and observe what's going on in my garden because it's those things that I learn the most from it would be really easy just to pick the beans and totally check out but I'm in the business of learning how to become a better gardener so I want to pay attention to what's happening what's going on because these little critters you know the the bee in the sunflower on the right is doing a lot of work for me. And uh, I really appreciate that work. So I might as well notice that bee and say thank you <laughs> on occasion. Uh, again, some more images like early season gardening on the left. You know, there's growth, there's mowing. Um, you know, it looks like chaos. Uh, that patch of grass that you see above the rhubarb is actually chives and Egyptian onions and uh, you know, a few other perennial herbs. And then on the right, um, you can see the grass. I wanted to show that, you know, I don't worry about the grass. If I'm worried that it's out competing, I will discourage it by putting mulch down. I might bring some straw or hay over to these cucumbers where the marigolds are growing there. And I might kind of lift the vine and stick some straw under there if I think it's going to outcompete. But this is clearly late stage of the garden, right? You can see the silk on the corn. And uh, I don't see, I see the cucumber outcompeting the grass. So I'm constantly looking at competition, much like we would in our cattle herd. We talk about competition all the time. And so I'm looking at, okay, who gets the sunlight first? Who has the best chance at the moisture and who's getting fed really well here? And in this particular image, it's the cucumbers and the corn. So, and the marigolds. And so I win. <laughs> it's not a competition. Okay, so I wanna show you some like, you know, problems, like things that don't go well and how that feedback loop can be very helpful. Uh, you know, life got busy. I planted my corn, I disappeared. 
This is clearly very early on because there's not a lot of ground cover. There's not a lot of grass growing there. Um, there's quite a bit of, you know, other things, some pigweed and yeah, I don't know what else is going on there. I'm not too concerned. I know I need to do something, but I'm not too concerned because if you look at the picture on the left, the bare ground is covered. Now it's out competing my corn. So you can see over here, I uh, began to pull some weeds because I, th I thought that in order to save my corn, I would need to do something. As it turned out, and I didn't take pictures, I'm really bummed I didn't, um, I weeded several rows and then I mulched them with straw. And then I did a control group. I went over three rows and all I did was step. Like I walked right down my row of corn and I stepped and it discouraged the growth of the pigweed and put straw on that. So I didn't pull, I saved my back and it had the exact same results. And I wish I would have got that picture. Um, you just gotta take my word for it. Um, either way, and so reducing the workload again, like I don't have to pick those. In fact, that root in the ground is doing a good job. Why would I remove it? I just need to create an environment where my corn has the ability to capture solar energy and at least have a chance. Okay, so I was doing a garden tour. I do several a year. And uh, last year I was doing a garden tour and believe it or not, um, you know, I guess it wouldn't be a surprise that for the last 10 or 15 years that I've been doing garden tours, it's predominantly women. They, they do a lot of the gardening, not always. And I'm, I'm not making, you know, any conclusions here. But last year I held a gardening seminar and I had five women and the rest were men. And there was probably 32 people that showed up. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. So there was one fellow and he said, well, that all sounds, you know, fine and good, but what's your yield? Like, you know, I mean, it's probably a retired farmer. I get, you know, yield's important. And I said, is that important to you? And I wasn't being coy. I was just like, well, is that really important? Like how many potatoes do you need to grow? And he said, well, it's just me and my wife. We really don't need much. And I said, so I grow enough. <laughs> and that's, and, you know, it sounds cheeky, but we get stuck in a production mindset about, well, if we grow a potato and it doesn't bring more than, you know, 15 pounds of potatoes, then we're failing. Well, I mean, if you're in competition with your neighbor and they get more than you and you define your self-worth on how many potatoes you grow, well, then, yeah, I mean, maybe you want to look at that. But I, my goal is to grow enough for my family. My goal is to not have to buy any potatoes a year uh, in a year. My goal is also to have enough seed potato so I can continue to grow potatoes year after year. And uh, I wanna talk about the, you know, the potato famine later, um, but I, I don't, I grow enough. I haven't had to buy potatoes. So again, a big win for me. And I wanna show you. Here's a very abundant potato harvest, 2019. Just going and going. And so I wished I wished I could have, you know, had him that that farmer, lovely fellow. I wish I could have had him come for harvest. Because uh, one of the things that I don't have in my presentation is how easy it is to harvest my potatoes, which is to go along, remove that mulch, and there's like a bird's nest of potatoes right there on the top. They're clean. I roll them over. They cure for half a day. Uh, stick them in a bucket and haul them to you know one of our sheds that's temperature regulated for the winter. It's pretty remarkable. A very smooth process. But again, this image is diversity. There's lots going on. I have an arch. It's an old sheep fence. I just you know prop it up with some. Um, uh, some electric fence posts and uh, have this archway so I can sit on a bucket and uh, pick my beans without killing my back, which is super nice. So, you know, less work, easier on your body. But look at the, I think there's oats growing there. So those germinated from the straw that I used. Um, my pumpkins are there and there's grass growing through the pumpkins, but again, not out competing them. So that's what I'm monitoring. This is a late season picture too. So 
where if it was earlier in the season, I would have mowed that grass because it might outcompete eventually. And, um, but in this case, I'm gonna let it grow because the more growth that I have over the winter, the more protected that is and the better start that I have in the spring. And more diversity, lots of variation going there. Some grass, not worried about it. Healthy beans, healthy corn, healthy grass, just not a lot. Just a few images, abundance, man, I love pictures. You know, I grow tons of, of corn. You know, in the last 21 years, there have been three years when I haven't had corn enough corn to, to freeze. And a couple of those years, I had enough corn to eat, but not enough, you know, not enough to freeze. And one of those years, I just didn't have any corn, it just didn't work out. But uh, when I first moved here, they say, oh, you might get corn or two out of every 10 years. Anyway, um, uh, another picture, uh, people think this was super chaotic. It is, it's chaotic. I get it. It's, it's chaos. It's organized chaos and it's, it's intentional chaos. There's a lot going on there and I love it. All right. So I want to open it up for questions. Kelly, have you been keeping tabs on questions? That was, uh, yeah, just over an hour. Okay. Yeah, there's been a few questions coming in. Uh, okay. The first one is, as you let things go to seed, are you just pleasantly surprised when they pop up and cultivate them where they are? Or do you kind of plan for that? If um, they aren't going to outcompete with um, with what I want to grow there, uh, then I just, I leave them. Um, but because there's so much cover on the bare ground, like one of the, you can call it downsides is, uh, when I had tilled soil, my volunteer spinach would come up everywhere. And it was always really nice because be like, oh, there's some spinach there. And, you know, I can harvest when there's cover. Some of those seeds don't come back volunteer. So what I'm doing is, um, you know, those spinach, they go to seed. I harvest the seed and then I put them in the spring. Like I'm just about to go out probably in the next couple of days and plant that volunteer, quote on, you know, I'm assisting the volunteer spinach to get to the place where I want it. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, but there are things like uh, pansies, uh, poppies, uh, sunflowers, borage, um, you know, lots of things that I will just let grow wherever I want them to, unless they're gonna pose a problem with what I have growing there. So, you know, uh, borage works really well in corn but I might not have borage growing in another area of the garden if it's going to outcompete or, you know, is not a good companion. So next question. Um, so it's, did you add straw to your rows? And I guess how much do you add? Um, as much as you need. I know that's not very helpful, but if you have, you know, this much straw, um, it's hard to get around. So that's not very much fun. Um, you know, if you have, and I'm just, you know, giving indications here, if you have this much straw, it might prohibit things from growing and, um, you know, and start to break down throughout the year. So that might be the magic number. If you only have this much, things are going to start to grow and you'll know that there's not enough to prohibit uh, growth. But if you, you know, if you have something like potatoes that grow pretty quickly, you may not need this much straw. You might need straw around them, but in between, if you noticed one of my pictures, there really wasn't any straw there at all. There was grass and I just mow it. And so I don't need to be managing all that straw. The, the sod basically does the same thing with less work. Okay, so you're rotating your beds and rows every how many years and how do you decide? Um, so what I believe is that nutrients move laterally. I know that fungi can take up, like one fungi can take up like a thousand acres. So I don't really need to move um, my rows. I move my rows because I think it's fun to do. And I'm trying to demonstrate, you know, how, how simple it is. And so in some of my garden, I would say three to five years, I just go out and because I want the rows to look differently. I want them to go north, south instead of east, west, or I, I want them to go in curly cues. And, you know, I have a little bit of fun because there's an artistic side of me that really wants to sort of paint that canvas. Um, I don't think I have to. I could keep the same ones. 
And so of those beds that I you know, want to maintain, I'll take my shovel or my spade and I'll just step it in around that area. I don't, I don't pull anything. I don't do, I just cut kind of truncate those roots to prevent them from going into the bed where I have delicate things like carrot seeds or lettuce or something like that growing. And I'm just discouraging those lateral roots to go in those beds that I have. Um, so I would say on average though, it's about three to five years when I've kind of switched things up. I don't do it all at once. So each section of the garden is sort of altered a little bit each year, but all in all, it's probably a five year cycle, I would say. Hey, we had an emailed question in. She said uh, she's relatively new to gardening. It's just her third year um, at their rental. And so they have a large on the ground garden. So it's a 12 by 20 or 12 by 35 ish feet. Um, it has very compacted soils. Uh, mm -hmm. So their landlord comes and tills for them every spring to loosen up the soil so they can plant the seeds, but the weeds are ridiculous and they just can't keep up with them. Uh, they grow mainly root vegetables because they store and freeze well. So the beets, carrots, garlic, onions, potatoes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, their concern is to how to do the no-till met method of gardening in a way that uh, allows these vegetables to grow well under such conditions. Um, mm -hmm. And finding good quality compost is very difficult and pricey for such a large garden. So they're kind of looking for what can they do this year? Yeah, um, if you can't, you know, develop the soil below very quickly, then develop it above. And so, you know, and or maybe a combination in between. So um, what I mean by that is, if you let things decompose on the surface, they will create topsoil. They, they will eventually. Um, you know, that's what composting is. You have a, a nice ratio of brown and green, and eventually it turns into things that look, uh, something that looks like dirt. And so I would really encourage them, um, you know, when they till the soil, it gives the illusion of aeration because you've dug it up and you've put air into it, but it actually creates more compaction. So one of the thing that I would suspect is that because it's been tilled every year, it, it gets more and more compacted. And so, because it settles and there's nothing in between like roots or, you know, um, microbiology that's creating those air spaces and for you know water to travel and for air to move about so things like potatoes uh, i mean they grow anywhere uh pumpkins they grow anywhere um you can put a potato on that really hard surface and cover it with straw and it's going to grow and that straw over time will decompose and next year you might have this much topsoil so you, there's a way to develop that above. And as you do that, things will uh, adjust below at the same time, but you don't have to do it with your own hands. The plants will do it for you. So I would really encourage them to grow. Maybe if uh, all they had time to do is just to go out there and throw a bunch of potatoes on the ground and roll, you know, find a bale of straw from a neighbor, um, you know, somebody, somebody's uncle who has an old rotted out straw bale and uh, just cover for that. Um, so that would be my suggestion for them. There are other ways, you know, that you can create that soil, lasagna gardening, things like the cardboard and, you know, grass clippings and it takes a little, a little encouragement, but that, that could still work. So how would you measure the fungi to bacteria ratio in your soil? Hmm. Uh, Haney test. I mean, you could, you probably can answer this one better than I can, Kelly. Um, there are soil tests that will tell you that information. Um, my guess is, I mean, you can do a basic pH. If you're really concerned about things being in balance, you can just get some litmus paper and, and uh, do some very simple soil sampling. Um, I personally don't believe that it's that important to know what it is but that through your management, you can have it go more in balance. So, you know, fungi have the job of breaking things down to make the nutrients available for the plants. And so um, you want something there. Most people are like, oh, there's mushrooms in there. That's a really bad sign. Well, it means that something's out of whack, but things are starting to decompose and become available to your plants. So you go try and do something about that. Uh, you know, if there's a little bit of mold somewhere in your soil, try something, put something there, 
and see if it changes it at all. And that's where I would focus your time is not so much because what would you do with, I have, you know, a 40, 47 to two ratio. Like, would you tell your neighbors? Would you go to the coffee shop? I mean, I, I just, I'm sort of being facetious, but what would you do with that information? It's just the knowledge of knowing that there should be more of a balance and that we can try to balance that out with our management of our gardens. And that's the important piece for me. Okay, do pests, i.e. cutworms, overwinter in the grass? Um, they planted tillage, radishes, and fall rye to incorporate the green matter the following spring, and they overwintered in the grass and decimated their garden last year. Yeah, um, yeah, so cut cutworms, they, you know, they seem to come and go, and I don't really know what environment. All I know is that when I have lots of diversity, um, I have less of an issue. So the more diversity that I have, and I mean, I don't just mean like, oh, I do 15 different kinds of vegetables. That's lots of diversity. Well, there are many monocultures, right? <laughs> like you just have all carrots and all onions and all potatoes. And those aren't really, that's not really diversity. So having multiple kinds of plants together decreases the amount of pests that I have. Um, I haven't had cutworm issues for a very long time. I've had cutworms. So I'll go out and I'll see like a cucumber plant that's, you know, six inches high. And I've just been so excited about it coming. And I go out there and it's like, it's like a lumberjack was out there. And that's really discouraging, but it only happens to two or three plants because I don't have a high population of cutworms because maybe I have red spider mites and they don't like those. Or maybe I have, you know, too many daddy long legs or uh, or ladybugs and they eat them. I, I just don't really know who does or what does. I just know that everything sort of seems to be in balance. So if I lose a few cucumbers, I'm not out much. Um, so I have yet to come across like decimation from one particular species, but I would venture to guess it's because there is not enough diversity. So when you hill your potatoes, you use just straw and then you just pile it up. That's how you do it. Yep. Yeah, or hay. Hay is the best because I feel like it's probably a little bit healthier and people are like, oh, they're, you're going to bring all that grass seed in. Well, I hate to break it to you folks. The grass seed is already there. It's probably been there for the last 50 or 100 years. And so you're not going to win that battle. So instead of, you know, trying to fight the, the seeds, just manage the seed. Um, create an environment where it's not conducive for that seed to grow if you don't want it to grow. And so I bring in the hay because I think there's there's more diversity of seed in there because that's what I want, you know, more clover, more grasses, more whatever is in there. And, um, and I also, you know, I, I don't want to spend all my time trying to hill. So I throw the hay up and then I walk away. I really do. I, I come back when they're, you know, it's July 10th and I, I want to harvest all those young potatoes. Okay. Um, what do you use for climbing veggies to keep them climbing? So I had all that sheep fence. You probably saw a lot of that, like that page wire. Um, I just went out. I, I would go to your local farmer if you can and say like, hey, do you have anything hanging around here that's in that junk pile out there, scrap metal? Um, I use all kinds of things around the base of my house. I just nailed up all kinds of like... Uh, farming implements that, you know, I'd find out in the bush and just nail them up on the side of my, my deck and have things growing, you know, Virginia creepers and things like that. So I, you could use some posts with a few farming implements, uh, you know, machinery uh, to, to do that if you wanted to. If that doesn't appeal to you, um, finding any sort of stake, like, you know, flat or lattice or something that you can use, it doesn't really take much doesn't take much at all. Um, I know a lot of people who don't have their peas climb. They just let them grow. Um, and, you know, it's a little harder to harvest is all. Uh, but you can do two posts and a bunch of string if you wanted to. Um, they don't They don't really need much at all. Uh, when do you generally stop mowing in the fall? Uh, when it starts out competing. So, you know, when my plants are fairly mature, uh, they're going to they're going to canopy over things that pose a problem. So they, you know, the plants underneath are, are weak. They're still growing, but they're weak. So 
it kind of depends on the growing season. Honestly, there isn't a day that I stop. Um, it's about the monitoring, just seeing what's going on. If it's getting tall and I think it's going to start out competing, then I would mow it or just walk over it. Sometimes you can just step on it and discourage it slightly. That's all you need to do. Um, the next question is, can they get more information on the compost buckets? Yeah. Um, so I just took five gallon buckets, cut a hole in the bottom, fill it with compost. Um, it's the concept around tea, compost tea. So concentrated water that's been steeped, if you will, through the compost bucket is very rich in nutrients. And uh, tomatoes like to feed from the roots, not the leaves so much. They're a nightshade plant. And while they withstand, especially pH balanced water, like rainwater, they can, they can handle that. They don't prefer it. Uh, and so they thrive much better when they're watered through their root system. And what better way to do that than to have a really rich compost tea. So I, I put the compost in those buckets and either poke holes or have a big hole in the bottom. So whatever rainwater goes through is basically fertilized water um, through my composting scraps. Uh, or if it's super dry and we're not getting any precipitation events, I will take a hose down there and I'll just stick the hose in the top of the compost bucket and let the water seep through the compost tea and water the plants that way. So typically for your garden size, how many bales of hay or straw do you typically use in a year? Now I only need one because there's so much grass. I really only need it to kind of boost my potatoes to cover any sort of bare ground that I might find from time to time. Um, my cucumbers, when I plant my cucumbers, you know, the grass is growing up next to them and they take quite a while to get going. So I'll mow and I'll mow and I'll mow. And then um, when the cucumbers really start to take hold and they're going to start to grow outwards, I just lay a bunch of straw over the grass and then the cucumbers creep over the straw. It makes it for really easy picking, which I like. And so I also have a trellis. So I usually put like my pickling cucumbers that grow up. I train them to grow up and my slicing cucumbers to grow sideways. So then if I want to go out and pickle, I'll go to the back of the trellis and pick all the picklers. And if I want slicing, then I go to the front and just kind of step through like an Easter egg hunt and find those. So um, I don't really need much now. Uh, the, the garden is pretty self-sustaining for covering its own bare ground at this point in time. Uh, and a bale, by bale, I mean like a round bale. So, you know, probably 800 to a thousand pound round bale. But I have two thirds of an acre of a garden and that might last me, you know, a full year to a year and a half depending. Awesome. So at the end of your season, do you just leave the plants where they grew or do you mulch them down and let them decompose throughout the winter in the row? Uh, both. I think those are kind of the same question. So I leave them and they are, they just stay there. So I, one of the videos I wanted to show you that I didn't get uploaded was what my corn looks like, which is sort of like it comes up and then it falls over. So it's kind of touching the ground, but not entirely. And the video was me just kind of taking that plant and um, you know, picking up one and seeing like all of the, the earthworms that are already active. They, there's a lot of uh, decomposition happening. So there's heat there and the worms are attracted to that right now. And uh, all I do is I leave those root masses in the soil because I don't wanna really disrupt what they've got going on there. There's lots of little worm parties happening. And so I just sidestep the corn. And, you know, I have, I don't know, probably 30 rows of corn. It's, it's a really great hip flexor workout, but I just step with my rubber boots or my shoes or whatever and have them come in contact. I'm going to plant my peas there because I really think corn takes a lot of nutrients and I want to put those nitrogen fixers into that soil right away. And so then I just rake them to the side and plant the peas there. Um, so by the time uh, I plant potatoes there after the peas. So next season, 2024, I won't be able to see the corn at all. It decomposes within the year. So, um, and that's been the, you know, the past uh, at least 10 years that that's happened. Okay. Hey, um, if you're going to introduce grass into your garden, what would you seed? Uh, you don't have to seed it. The seed's already there. You just have to wait. So the succession plant will come. It'll be dandelion, uh, Pigweed, you know, depending on your environment, there'll be some indicator species that come. 
Uh, so if you build it, they will come. Just wait long enough. So whatever plant comes first, when it gets starts to get high, high enough to outcompete whatever you've got growing, mow it down. Just don't mow, just don't mow your carrots. <laughs> just be careful. <laughs> and mow it down, mow it down, mow it down. And pretty soon you'll start to see the grass because grass will outcompete everything. Uh, it will eventually, it's sort of at the top of the succession, um, at least sort of in this ecosystem, in this area. And so if you continue to mow, bushes won't grow because they don't like being mowed, but grass will definitely. So you don't have to buy any seed. It'll cut, it's already there, it's free. <laughs> um. So currently they have a problem with slugs under mulch. How would you control them? Yeah, so um, depending on the year, like I've never had, never had slugs here before. Um, it, our farmers have never had slugs for forever uh, until about five years ago. Um, I remember our neighbor saying, God, like I had a whole bunch of seagulls out in my field. I didn't know what was going on. I went out there, there's all these slug eggs and slugs and the seagulls were feeding off of them. And sure enough, the next year, I swear that seagull heard me and then like came and dropped some because I, I just don't never had the problem before. Slugs like moisture. So when you have cover, there is moisture and they really like the surface or the sorry, the place between the mulch and the soil surface. So you can go out there, look under the mulch, you'll see all these tiny little, they look like, you know, fish eggs basically. What I know, so through holistic management, what I know is that if you look to the weakest point in the life cycle of that animal, you are much better off in controlling that species. And the weakest point in the slug's life cycle is the egg because it needs to have the exact temperature and moisture conditions. So if, there, if, if there's a year where I have slug, slug eggs, they only have to be exposed. What I think I've narrowed it down to is for two hours and it'll completely wipe out all of this. Like they just shrivel up. So, you know, there, it's a pretty easy solution. I mean, I know once the slugs are born um, and they're on your plants, people have used salt and beer and, you know, all kinds of things. But the best way I know how is to just air out uh, some of my rows and I don't have to do it all at one time because they take a little while, is I'll go out and do three or four rows and just air them out and then put the mulch back up. I can stay ahead of any sort of grass or forbs in competition with that. And uh, that seems to do the trick. Um, have you ever done plastic mulch instead of grass? Uh, I've, I, I haven't, and I haven't for a very specific reason. Um, plastic, especially dark plastic, uh, creates a huge um, issue or barrier for microorganisms because it gets too hot. You basically sterilize, so you would prevent seeds from germinating, uh, but you've also increased the temperature soil, sometimes 20 degrees Celsius, and basically everything fries. So uh, while it can be a, an effective tool for managing weeds, it can be really ineffective for water cycle and mineral cycle um, and so I, I dis, I, I discourage it. I, it's not that I would never use it. There might be some cases where I would, uh, maybe starting a garden, you know, if you just have like a whole bunch of, um, of land between two sheds that has never been touched and you want to kind of manage that, you might want to kill everything off. You could use plastic to do that, do that in like August and kill everything, you know, in the heat of July and August and then cover it for September until winter comes. And then in the spring, you'd probably have a pretty good, but just know you're also killing all the microorganisms at the same time. Um, have you ever had scab on your potatoes or do you think like no-till kind of helps with preventing scab? I mean, I, I do, I don't have a problem with scab like a, on occasion. I think so much of it depends on, uh, you know, how rich your soil is and then how much moisture but I, I really don't know why scabs exist. So I'm not in the business of figuring that out. Um, on occasion, I will have scabs, but I don't have like um, indigestible, you know, like they're not the big black ones. They're just sort of little bumps. 
So uh, it's not an issue. Like I don't have to peel potatoes because of them. There's just a little bit of irregularity in their skin. So I don't know if that's two different types of scab. Uh, we generally don't have an issue. Um, so I can't say that that's worse with mulch or better with mulch. I'm, I really can't answer that other than it's not really a problem. Uh, going back to the compost buckets, um, oh. are, do you layer them with anything or just organics from your kitchen garden? Yep, just uh, so all year we take a bucket from the kitchen under the kitchen sink and dump it on the ground by the garden. It has like carragana weave or woven carragana sticks around it so we know where it is. We just dump all year. In the spring, I'll turn it a couple of times and uh, move it to one side. And then we put fresh scraps on the other. And by June, when I put the tomatoes out, everything that we've eaten over the past winter is basically soil by that time. And so I just put that right in. And it's really rich. It's quite green in terms of you know, green manure. So it's really rich compost, but it doesn't come in direct contact with the plant and the tomatoes and uh, uh, pumpkins or squash plants really love it. Um, do you ever have trouble with rodents in a no-till? I don't, um, but I also have cats and dogs and, you know, there's lots of predator control here. Um, intentionally, like we have lot, we have barn cats and, you know, house cats, uh, so that we don't have mice in our vehicles and mice eating our saddles and mice eating, you know, my beans and things like that. On occasion, I'll see like a vole will have tried some beets or carrots or something, but again, not a problem. Um, the cats love to be in the garden with me and they protect me. Actually, I had a, my little cat chased away a fox last year fox came into the garden and the cat scared it away so i feel like they have a job to do uh and they do i think just their smell so i actually grow catnip in my garden specifically to draw the cats in and you know they they eat the catnip and they get really lovey and then they rub up against every post or you know whatever i have in the garden and so their smell is everywhere and uh so i don't have rodents as an issue Okay, I'm going to combine two questions into one. So what kind of things do you plant together for your biodiversity? And the other question was, uh, do you plant, do you tend to plant peas near sunflowers so they can climb up the sunflowers? I have a very large pea patch and I need to be very efficient in terms of picking and shelling peas. So um, I have things like dill and borage and pansies and, uh, you know, growing in my pea patch but they don't get in the way of picking. Um, having to pick peas off of, if you have a very small patch of peas and sunflowers, sounds like a great idea. Uh, I think they're compatible. They, you could probably Google that to make sure that they don't hinder each other, that they get along both above and below ground. Um, but I have had peas grow or sunflowers grow in my pea patch and I leave them there. So, you know, it's not like I would destroy a, a sunflower just to get it out of the way. Um, and the companion gardening, so there's lots of really great resources out there. Um, you know, I just really tried to avoid, like, you would think carrots and dill would be beautiful together because they taste great when you, you know, cook with them. But no, they really don't like each other. And dill will outcompete just about everything. So, you know, you just want to be really mindful. Um, but yeah, there's some things that I really do. Like pumpkins are always near the corn. I know that that's a match made in heaven. And uh, it just brings me joy every time I see them together. And, uh, you know, I put things like lettuce and um, celery and beets. They all really like to be together. So I can throw those kind of in the same, in the same place. Uh, herbs. I always have my tomatoes growing next to my perennial herbs and uh, annuals. So, you know, basil, cilantro, dill. Those are all nearby. So those are just some of the things, but there's lots of information out there. If you just Google companion gardening, you'll get a, a long list of what likes and dislikes each other. So you kind of got into a little bit of what your succession plantings are. So you had like the corn, the peas, potatoes. So then what do you usually do after? Yeah, so it's kind of those major crops in my garden are on a three-year rotation. Um, because I have so much diversity going on there, I don't think that I need anything more than that. Um, and like I said, things grow laterally quite a bit. So I probably don't even need to do that, but 
I make, it makes me feel like a farmer when I'm doing crop rotation. So uh, I, yeah, the, the corn uh, requires a lot of nutrients. We know that. So I put in the legume after that. And, um, and then, then I rotate those three. So then after the peas would be the potatoes, potatoes don't really require much of anything, but when they go in after the peas, I know that their fruits will be much more nutrient dense because there's a lot of available nitrogen for them. Um, and then I start over. So then corn goes in after that. So it's, uh, and also that makes it a lot easier when I go to plant corn, if I put it in the year after, if I put it in uh, where potatoes were the previous year, it's very easy for me to just drag a little um, stick along the soil surface, drop my corn plants in and rake over uh, because the, the potatoes were there in the fall and were harvested. So it's pretty much ready to go. So do you use the same methods uh, in your perennial beds um, as you do in your annuals? Um, is your soil temp a problem? Are your perennials delayed with no-till? Uh, no, and quite the contrary, actually. Uh, I've, I had a picture for you to show you tonight that, you know, my rhubarb is ready to go. Um, I've got little like bulbs popping up as soon as it gets some sunshine there, maybe a little bit of a rain, we're going to be in business. Um, there's, uh, you know, chives are coming out already. Um, they're on the north side of my garden, so they get the most sun exposure because I have trees on both sides. So the south side still has a little bit of snow. It's not frozen, but there is still snow there. So at one point I had my perennial bed on the south side and it did take a while to get going, but mostly because of the shade and the frost stays in there longer. So uh, through about three years, I just transplanted everything over to the north side and I'm very happy with that. Um, the only thing I do differently is I mulch in between my plants. So, you know, I have big, uh, chive plants growing there. If I don't mulch, then the grass will grow up into the chives and that can, you know, eventually choke out the chives. So I just put a lot of mulch around each plant. Harvest regularly. That really helps. I use a lot of herbs in my cooking, so I'm down there all the time. Uh, so just for clarification, your seed potatoes are just under the straw and barely in the ground, not in a dug hole. They're on the ground. Uh, in fact, one year, I just wanted to demonstrate that I could basically grow potatoes under any conditions. And there was a little bit of grass and um, some leftover uh, pea straw. And so there wasn't direct soil contact. Uh, I just walked and chucked in a general line the seed potato. And then I took our our flat deck bale feeder, like I took <laughs> the truck out there and I unrolled the bale using the cattle, you know, cattle bale feeder and just covered up, just drove back and forth and unrolled a hay bale over top of them. It was one of my best years in potatoes. Like they, they really thrived that year and uh, they can just grow. I mean, you can take a, some chicken wire, throw some potatoes in there covered in straw and just keep it watered and they'll, it'll grow potatoes. It's really, it's miraculous, actually. Okay. Um, one person has invasive creeping bellflower. I wish them all the luck because it's indestructible. But if you want to grow, like how, how would you control invasive species? That, invasive like, creeping bellflower? Is that like, I, I'm not even sure what that is. Is it like bindweed it's, it's, or buckwheat? Wild no, buckwheat? It's, okay. it's a flower that honestly, like nothing kills it. Like I had it in a property I owned and like- yeah you can, you can spray it. You can try and pull it. You'll be forever fighting it. It mm -hmm. grows practically in concrete. So yeah, it's, um, it's like, but like for invasive species, if you wanted to try and control them, how would, how would you go about that? Yeah. You've got to figure out an environment where it doesn't thrive or that you, you know, you have other species that you can get going uh, and solid before it does. And so, you know, I'm, Sometimes that's mowing, um, but you know that doesn't help you in between plants because you can't mow right over the top or use a weed whacker or anything. So um, I, I'm not familiar with that species, so I don't want to say too much. But what I do know is that when I have something growing, I, I need to figure out a way to prevent it from out competing what I want to grow. 
And then once those established plants have grown far enough, then very little becomes uh, a problem. Um, uh, if you want to akin it to anything, it's like the cockroach weeds. Yeah. Uh, even the cockroach has a job. <laughs> so, you know, and I, um, I, I just, I really caution and I wouldn't say like, oh, just let it be. I, I mean that it's doing something. It is an indicator of previous management and that's nothing against what you've been doing in your garden before, but it, you've created an environment where it thrives or when it's been able to take over. And so it's about figuring out how do we reverse that, not maybe completely eliminate it, but to get it back in balance. And I'm guessing exposed soil is one of those environments that it really thrives. So what happens when you cover everything, everything, and then just create a little bit of space where you want your lettuce to grow? I'm guessing it would have a really hard time thriving. Um. So if somebody was to start no-till gardening, is it good to start on a soddy area? You can, you've got, you've got to remember like the principles of, of uh, germination is the seed, unless it's a potato, <laughs> the seed must have, you know, soil contact generally um, or something like it, a medium, right? Some things will germinate in a paper towel because it's similar to soil, but eventually it's going to need to be in a soil base. So, uh, making sure that you have seed to soil contact um, and that the grass or the quack doesn't outcompete whatever it is that you're growing there. And so you'd have to figure out a way to manage, you know, get the soil exposed, plant the seed, and then manage that competition. Um, that's where some people have chosen to like plan a, a, a year ahead and cover their entire proposed garden space in tons of straw or cardboard or plastic to discourage a lot of growth and to try to get that ex that soil exposed without tilling it. And I'm not totally against tilling. I think tilling over time takes you in opposite direction of good soil health principles. But if you wanted to start by tilling, I mean, that's you're gonna use technology as a way to expedite what you wanna get out of that. So, you know, I, I don't judge people based on what they do, but if you tell me you want to have zero till gardening and you till every year, well, that's not, that's incongruous. Right? Um, so, but if you want to start gardening next year or this year, you might till and try to get started and then move towards, you know, not tilling anymore. That sounds like it would be a good solution. So if somebody wanted to follow your socials, how would they find you? Uh, Blues at Campbell, and uh, so you get, you get everything, right? You get a little bit of the ranch, a little bit of, you know, whatever. But um, in my photos, there are albums uh, basically starting, I think, in 2009. And they're generally, yeah, I think they're all labeled, you know, zero till year one, two, three, um, or labeled by the year. So you're welcome to uh, to do that. I don't have many privacy settings, so I think I think pretty much everyone has been able to access them. Hey, well, I think final tidbit for the night is if we're going to start this year, what would be number one? Uh, start with a plan, because if you, you know, fail to plan, you're planning to fail. <laughs> That's, uh, so, you know, draw on a piece of paper what you kind of think you want to do. And then, um, you know, I think ask yourself why, 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 what's your context? You know, why am I gardening? Am I gardening because I have to, you know, that, that changes things a little bit. If you're gardening because you want to, um, if you're gardening for, you know, personal reasons like health, uh, if you're gardening because you, you know, just really enjoy it, there's an artistic side to it, like ask yourself those, those questions. And that's going to determine a lot of how you go about gardening. Um, I would just strongly suggest for anyone, make sure whatever your actions are that you decide to do are taking you closer to that goal that you have. Okay. Well, with that, I want to thank you so much for your time tonight and thank you for all the information. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, it was great to see the progression because I think I saw your garden probably the last time, probably like, I don't know, maybe six years ago. So yeah, it was probably, yeah, it was probably about halfway through the process. That's fair. Yeah. So all right. Really well, thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, good luck. Uh, my, you know, my contact, I mean, Kelly, you have my contact information. I don't know if you, if you want to put that in the, um, in the 
the recording somehow or whatever, but I'm happy to answer any more questions. Find me on Facebook um, and we'll talk. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And everybody have Very a really much. wonderful night. All right. Good night.